sweet. All right. I think we're, we're five past the hour so we can get rolling. Um, so I'm here today to talk about compliance the hard way. Uh, give you a little bit about, about me. Uh, my name is Joel. I'm currently the CTO here at Move. Um, I hail from Chicago. I was born and raised in Chicago, basically spent my whole life there. Um, I've been involved in various aspects of open source since the mid to late 90s, uh, back um, in the early, the early days of, of things like Linux. Um, spent 20 years in payments, uh, built um, two companies prior to coming to Move. Uh, one is an early employee and the other is a, a co-founder. Um, my whole career in payments has been involved uh, in technology, uh, payments technology. Um, I pretty much have done just about anything you can imagine in payments. I've built business systems to run payments. I've built or, uh, business systems to facilitate onboarding of clients for payments, front ends, back ends, payment gateways. Um, and one thing I've done actually through all three organizations is focused on compliance. Um, just a little bit more history. The last company that uh, I helped co-found, uh, we ended up um, going through two acquisitions and created about a billion dollars of valuation uh, for our, our investors. Um, so we ended up selling to private equity in 2013 and then turned around and sold to First Data in 2017. I've been with Move uh, for four months and pretty much that whole time I've been focused on Compliance. So, uh, just a funny story. Um, one of my coworkers was actually supposed to be talking to you today, um, and he couldn't make it because uh, he actually, um, unfortunately, got COVID. He's he's recovered from it. Um, so, uh, Wade, you know, you all have seen Wade and probably know Wade. Um, when Wade asks you to do something, it's really hard to tell him no. Um, so he he asked me to to give you all a speech and. So I was sitting there contemplating like what I was gonna talk about. And I was thinking, okay, I'm gonna be talking to you all for 30 to 45 minutes. And uh, they were like, no, you're actually in a workshop and that's 90 minutes. <laughs> so I was really racking my brain about what I was gonna talk to everybody about. And I realized, you know, it's funny, Angela had talked a lot about when, when engineers kind of run into the same problem multiple times they recognize the need to do something about it. And I've now gone through compliance uh, in three organizations in the exact same manner. And I suddenly had this epiphany that um, maybe I should talk about compliance and then maybe um, we should actually do something about making compliance a lot more palatable for not only, you know, us at, at Move, but also other organizations in FinTech who inevitably are dealing with compliance. So let's talk a little bit about compliance. <laughs> compliance is filled with acronyms. This is probably the one slide I actually have to read <laughs> because there's so many acronyms and they're so hard to remember. Um, you know, you have everything from SOC or SOC 2, right, which if you're a SaaS company, um, either your vendors or your clients are demanding that you're SOC 2 compliant, right? So they want assurances that you're managing their data, right, and protecting their data. You have PCI. Um, you know, if you're accepting, transmitting, or storing cardholder data, card numbers, you have to comply with PCI. And then you have, you know, a, another you know, long list of um, acronyms. So you have BSA. So if you're dealing with sponsor banks, you're going to need to ultimately adhere to some element of their BSA compliance. And then you have KYC, KYB. So a lot of times as part of that, that BSA effort, you need to know your customers. You need to know, you know, if they're consumers, it's KYC. If, if you're, they're businesses, you need to know who those businesses are. And then you start getting into consumer privacy. So, you know, that, that starts going down to the state level. So you have California, who has probably the most stringent um, consumer privacy 
regulations in the country. Um, that actually was based on um, GDPR coming out of Europe. So the minute you go international, you have another laundry list of consumer compliance regulations that you need to meet. So you, you know, then you start getting into Brazil has its own version, South Africa has its own version. So suddenly you're, you're just drowning in all of these acronyms. And inevitably, particularly when you're in startup mode, um, you don't have a compliance group. You don't have a CISO. And <laughs> so when, what ends up happening is compliance and security get commingled, and usually that falls into the engineering team. So the engineering team suddenly becomes the benefactor of all of the security and compliance efforts. And a lot of times those teams are they're understaffed, so they're trying to build feature functions. They might even be undertrained, right? They're not compliance and security folks necessarily. They're engineers building products and features and functions. Um, and you know, as soon as they start digging in, they realize that a lot of security and compliance is actually theater. And I, I would tell you, you know, good engineer team, great engineering teams care about their craft, and so they inevitably kind of fall into a place where they start treating compliance as something that um, is not gonna be security theater, and they end up going about it in a very, very difficult way because they wanna do it right. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of the, 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 the pillars of compliance is what I'll call them. And a lot of times, you know, it starts with principles. And, and, and how do you define your principles of compliance? A lot of times that's driven by um, you know, regulatory um, compliance, industry compliance, client demand or client requirements. And sometimes it's also honestly driven by the company itself, right? So there's a certain amount of risk tolerance that every business uh, will, will feel. And so you know, part of the goal with the principles is is really to, to maintain um, this balance between compliance and um, the needs of the business, right? You, you don't want to stifle the business. The business needs to make money, so compliance does need to be commercial. And then finally, um, it's not just an IT issue, right? So compliance affects every element of the business, sales, marketing, all the way down to customer service, so it's really, you know, it is a comprehensive, like the principles can't just be driven by IT. They, they really need to be embraced and um, come from the business or the organization as a whole. And then you need alignment, right? So I like to say that with compliance, the way to describe compliance is not like threat, you know, in, 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 when you start getting into security too, not threat landscapes, not risk management, but you need to be talking about compliance from the perspective of, of dollars, right? Of, of a monetary uh, conversation, because that's the lingo of the business. So if you're talking um, and, and aligning based on a monetary conversation, you tend to drive better alignment around compliance and security. And then you need to justify the expense, right? A lot of times, um, you know, the assumption is technology will solve the problem, and really technology is just an efficiency around controls. So you really want to make sure that um, when you're, you're justifying the expense, you have, again, a really good solid business case talking about the, the monetary proposition. And then finally, alignment needs to come from the top. I like to say that compliance becomes, uh, you know, a business lifestyle. <laughs> it really does. Um, and you will ultimately f run into roadblocks and resistance if you don't have uh, senior management driving that, that lifestyle proposition around compliance. And I mean, I could tell you, um, you know, even that move, there were a lot of questions around, you know, compliance, what it meant, the, the friction and overhead that came from compliance, and somebody like Wade catching that straight away and level setting the team made a world of difference. You know, that, it actually translates into velocity. And then finally, you need stakeholder support, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so that was that one was for you. <laughs> Again, you know, this isn't about spreading FUD, right? So when you're when you're driving compliance, it can't be around FUD. FUD doesn't work. You know, it needs to really come from a, a quantitative approach, um, and you need to ultimately work with your stakeholders. And, and I would say is go as far as actually gathering their requirements. Treat this like you would a typical engineering project. Gather requirements from your stakeholders and let them have an active voice and you know, let them join in on the fun of compliance. <laughs> Share the wealth. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, you know, level set, do level set on risk, right? So threat plus vulnerability plus probability plus impact equals risk, right? Set a common th um, baseline for what, and a common definition for what risk is and drive that into the organization. And then finally, you know, this is just kind of brings it all together, right? You have the business down at the bottom, you have, you know, consistent standards and guidelines, robust procedures that spread across your whole company, and then requirements and objectives and policies and communication actually happen somewhat at the, at the corporate level or the company level, but also happen you know, down at the business unit level. Um, and then ultimately that all drives, you know, again, this, this risk management or the, uh, risk management model. All right, so now let's, let's get into compliance the hard way, right? So, you know, we talked a little bit about kind of what you need to do from a compliance perspective. Um, <laughs> and, you know, typically, uh, this is my experience, and it's funny, I had some conversations with folks, and uh, the, the, their experience kind of mirrored and echoed mine. Um, typically, what the first thing you do in an engineering organization around, uh, once you've been told you, you have to swallow compliance, is you try to outsource it. Right, and in a startup, um, that's typically a very expensive proposition. And when you start talking to companies, they inevitably will spread, you know, not, not all of them, but some of them do a good job of spreading FUD. <laughs> they, they wanna make you feel like you need to go with them and if you don't, um, you will never achieve compliance. Um, a lot of times you will find kind of this weird mix of organizations who provide this capability. Um, some of them are niche and this is the space they play in. Others are, you know, communications companies, CPA firms, um, insurance companies actually provide compliance professional services. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times you end up, um, what I would say, in kind of a conflict of interest. Um, so you will end up a lot, in a lot of situations paying for standardized policies. Um, a lot of times these companies will take kind of off the shelf um, playbooks and apply them to your business. Um, and they won't really spend a lot of time or a lot of quality time digging into your procedures. And so inevitably too, once, once you've got your policies down, they will make recommendations for controls. Um, and again, those controls may not always be in your business's best interest. Um, you have to realize that they may be motivated by, you know, getting residuals or being paid money to push certain vendors. Um, so again, you know, compliance the, the hard way when you try to outsource it is just not a very um, wise decision for a startup. And so that inevitably leads you to going out to the internet and trying to do it yourself. Um, and it literally is a fire hose. Um, you will have vendors who will, you know, position themselves as thought leaders for certain compliance standards. Um, you will inevitably find lots of policies and procedures from universities, <laughs> which is, I, I can't explain it, I don't know why, but they do like to publish their policies and procedures. Um, but again, use cases don't really align, right? Students are not clients. Uh, universities, some people may argue they're businesses, um, but you know, they're much different than a commercial business. And so the other place you end up is um, actually NIST, right? So when I say government, it's typically NIST. Um, NIST has very extensive policies and procedures and guidelines to follow. Um, but again, it's a government use case. 
like I like to say it's like spy versus spy stuff. So like they're trying to prevent nation states from, from attacking them. And so again, it's typically overly ver verbose, um, not really an applicable use case. And, and ultimately too, you, you kind of find yourself in this place where if you're gonna go down this route, you're spending a lot of time refactoring these frameworks and policies and procedures to, to meet your needs. So again, you know, overly verbose, broad coverage. A lot of these policies, right, and the enforcement of these policies come from folks whose job it is and their sole job it is to, is to create policies and procedures. Um, a lot of times they're fully ignored. Um, it is just a compliance theater or a, a security and compliance theater. It, the, it, the people who are implementing them typically do it in a checkbox check fashion. And again, you end up shoehorning it into your organization. So a lot of effort spent on, you, know, you, think you, got, you, you think you may have a head start, but you end up spending quite a bit of time uh, refactoring. And so efficient policies, right? Like an example here of an efficient, uh, an efficient policy focus, you know, we, we call it AML. Um, and so, you know, again, it, you can define AML around your business, right? So what products do you offer? Who are your customers? Who are your stakeholders? Where are your customers, right? So how do you go about creating a policy that actually tailors uh, to your business? And so you end up creating something that is, is much more, um, I would say applicable to your business, but also, you know, just I would tell you a, a much simpler um, policy. Another focus is on passwords, right? So again, a similar situation where um, you, know, you define what type of passwords, right? So are they interactive, right? Do you have end users um, logging in, right? And then thinking about making sure the passwords um, may, are, are um, at a certain length, right? And, and maybe complexity is something that is important, maybe not. Um, and then most importantly, uh, implementing multi-factor authentication. And then you have you know, service accounts, right? So you have machines um, that need, or, or applications that need access, and making sure that, again, that they have long passwords, but instead of MFA, um, utilizing certificates and tokens. And then uh, finally, you know, defining the risk level, right? What tools do you have to address the needs um, to, to form a policy, right? So look at what you have today, understand your gaps, and then um, look to fill those gaps. And so then, you know, you ultimately end up in a position where you're, you're defining controls. Um, and this is kind of the, you know, this is the buildup. This is the stuff that you still have to do. Um, so this is kind of the boring buildup um, to, to ultimately what we want to get to, um, which is, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to actually do announce this. Um, so I'm calling it Max. I'll tell you why in a second. Um, but we believe that compliance can actually be collaborative. So compliance is really hard. It won't get easy. But when you have a group of folks who are tackling compliance in an open source fashion, it actually spreads that burden and makes it easier for the collective, right? And, and so we came up with this concept in expanding the, the MOVE community to actually start tackling compliance. And one of the first things we said we wanted to do was set up a Slack channel around compliance. So how can we actively have conversations about compliance, whether that's policies and procedures, best practices, um, but also, you know, I think it's really important to, um, to, to be able to talk about the technology and tools that are used within the context of compliance. So another thing that, that happens with, with compliance, right, is when you go out and you start searching for tools, and technology to apply to your compliance efforts, you end up in a position where you're, you're again, you're dealing with, with two entities, commercial entities who some have great products, 
Some are selling snake oil. You have open source projects. Some are amazing. Others don't have um, the amount of marketing or visibility, um, but, but could ultimately um, um, satisfy your need. And then you also end up with, with open source projects too who may have a limited scope, and they may need some help. Um, so you know, the, some of the things that, that I've kind of dealt with um, in dealing with compliance is, is really finding the right tools to fill gaps, right? understanding what's quality, what's not, both commercially and, and from an open source perspective, and then um, creating policies right? and procedures and understanding best practices. So a lot of, a lot, a lot of my, my time spent in compliance, um, I, I felt like I had to do that alone, right? or, or within the context of, of the company I was working for. But I never felt like there was a community out there that could, you know, that was one, feeling the same pain that I was, but also, you know, in, share, in that shared pain could actually, like, get together and, and do something about it. Um, so in addition to uh, the Slack channel, we actually, um, we found a, a, a rendering tool um, called Comply. It's an open source rendering tool that takes Markdown and turns it into policies. Um, it's, it was developed by a, a company called StrongDM. It's, it's, it, has, it hasn't been actively maintained, I'll put it that way. Um, so we decided to fork it um, as part of Move's open source efforts. Um, and then we also um, started the process of creating an open source repository for policies and procedures. So our intent is to, again, create an active dialogue, but also create a place where folks um, who are actively engaged in compliance in some form or fashion have access to um, templated policies and procedures that they can take, contribute to, use within their own businesses, um, extend, and we certainly would welcome anybody willing to contribute. And then finally, um, you know, I, I had this idea around um, security tools and actually trying to stand up a marketplace. Um, as I said earlier, this, this speech ended up um, kind of falling into my lap. So, I, excuse me, I didn't have time to actually go out and either find an open source marketplace or build one. Um, but I had this idea that eventually um, it would be really great to have like a, a Yelp for um, security and compliance tools where it's community driven, tools can be rated, reviews can be given. Um, so as a, a, a kind of a, a crawl, walk, run mentality, I thought, you know what? We're doing everything in the context of GitHub today. Let's just start by using GitHub discussions. So I, I felt like that might be a good place to start having active dialogues around um, tools and, you know, and um, both commercially and open source that can help us with, with compliance. So the reason I call this Max, um, if, if any of you are um, children of the 80s, you'll remember th this, if it plays. Compliance, 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 compliance. Well, excuse me. Compliance. So th th I don't know if you all remember Flight of the Navigator. Seth does. Thank you, Seth. Somebody remembers Flight of the Navigator. <laughs> so as I'm thinking about this whole thing, all I could think about was Flight of the Navigator. Um, so on that note, um, what we want to do, because this is a workshop, and, and I have uh, my, my illustrious assistant, Jeff, up here with me, um, and no, I'm not going to cut him in half, um, he's, he's actually going to uh, walk through a demo of how we've implemented Comply, how we've implemented um, these policies and procedures in GitHub, and, and how you all, if you're interested, can get started both in the consumption and uh, the contribution to uh, MOVE's open source efforts around compliance. Um, right now, we're in the process of vetting all of our policies and procedures for copyright, um, but we fully intend to uh, take our uh, MOVE as, as a commercial entity take all of our policies and procedures and, and make them open source where we can, both from a SOC and PCI perspective to start. So on that note,
I'll talk as Jeff navigates. We have to do a swap, sorry. So the first thing we're going to do, did I lose my mic? Good, okay. The first thing we're going to do um, is we're going to install comply. So um, about an hour and a half before this conversation, um, we actually forked comply. We were debating if we were going to do that or not, and we made the decision to, to actually fork it. So this is the original comply from strong VM and it's got instructions on that out there on how to install it. We're going to walk through the Mac OS version of this. There's also Windows obviously and Unix. So sorry. Yep. I slipped that in on you so yep. we're going to no, jump good in. Good call. Eventually we need to get all these instructions out to everyone. So I'm going to be walking through stuff. We got kind of a straw man, but we'll get them out to everyone. So as part of the README for the project, we'll we'll lay out um, usage and install. I mean, I always kind of hate to fork a project, um, you know, and especially if it's got, if it's, if it's heavily maintained and has a strong community around it, I, I don't want to fork a project. But um, what we found with Comply was um, it wasn't regularly maintained. It had a fairly inactive community. And um, we saw pull requests that were sitting out there over a year um, and not being um, approved and merged in, or, or even rejected for that matter. They were just sitting there. And so, you know, there's, there's a lot of potential in comply. Um, and our thought was we can fork it, actively maintain it, um, and make it, in, or actually extend it beyond what its capabilities are today. So day one, um, comply is focused on SOC 2 primarily. And, you know, I. I see a place where we could add things like PCI in. Um, there's, you know, there's an opportunity to add many other, what I call, would call compliance standards into the mix. And two, I mean, it's the install process is non. It's, I mean, it's, it's trivial if you're technical. If you're, if you're non-technical, it's there's a lot of dependencies and the way. I mean, you can see here Jeff's installing some dependencies and. Um, you know, it's, the documentation is just not that great around um, installing the dependencies. So the, the install process is just not that great. Um, and at one point, they had, they had built a, um, a Docker container to um, actually facilitate some of the dependencies, but they let that go stale. So <laughs> when you try to use it, um, you end up with all kinds of errors. So again, just a, kind of a poor user experience. So what Jeff did is um, he installed, well, he's installing the second one now. So Pandoc, and then there's a, a version of LaTeX that's going to be a stripped down version of LaTeX that's going to be installed. Yeah, so the markdown is pretty cool. Um, so what, what, uh, what, Comply uses is all Markdown, and what's I think what's nice about Markdown is there's an opportunity to to one um, bring that into um, some form or fashion of automation. Um, also, it allows you the flexibility to 
uh, render the, the output um, in multiple formats. So if you want PDF, you can do PDF. If you, you know, want some other uh, format as output, you have that capability as well. So you know, Markdown's a little bit, um, I guess to, you know, Jeff and I were having this debate around, <laughs> is Markdown more or less efficient than say like HTML? Um, I think in this case, the, the benefit of Markdown probably outweighs the, the downside. Um, and there's plenty of, you know, if, if folks aren't that technical, there's, pretty, uh, there's, there's a fair amount of open source um, Markdown rendering tools out there that you know, will give you side-by-side -side comparisons of, of the Markdown as you're writing it and then uh, what the output of that Markdown will look like. So what I've thrown up there is a, an example of one of our policies. I've kind of taken a snippet out of it and um, turned it into Markdown. So that's, that's what Markdown looks like and what we've been talking about. These first few lines in the file actually have to do with comply the program. It strips those off and renames files and formats things. And um, it's basically a little bit of a command and a little bit of a link to other things. Uh, if you don't have that, it kind of barfs at you. Um, so wanted to point out, one, what Markdown looked like, and two, that this is where the link into Comply begins as you build out your policies. And so another cool thing that, that Comply has the ability to do, and some of this is based on the variables, is it will actually tie the policy to the, um, the, the requirement um, for the compliance standard. Um, and uh, there was something else I was going to say. <laughs> that one was a cool one. There was another, oh, it, it throws out an HTML page. So if you do have folks that are non-technical that need to see kind of the state. Oh, that sounds like a bolt, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Damn demos. I was worried about 90 minutes. I'm not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the other thing that, that Comply does is it, it actually creates um, an HTML page. So folks that are non-technical, if they want to track the compliance efforts um, of the business, they can actually have, a, you, can, you can provide them access to this HTML page and they can see the state of your policies as they relate to the requirements around um, the, 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 the compliance standard. And then it does hook into um, various ticketing systems. So it could hook into GitHub um, for ticketing. It could hook into JIRA. Um, so if you do have tickets and work that you want to assign as it relates to compliance, you can do it all in the context of, of comply. Yeah, and I think that's, that's kind of where, um, like, that's where the focus should be. I guess that's the best way to put it. it like, I would say 80% of, of policy creation is just standardized templates. And then there's that 20% that is really how you apply it to the business, right? And, and so that's why, like, to me, the policy and procedure templates are almost like primitives. I mean, I, I view them through that same lens as the primitives that Angela was talking about earlier this morning. It's the exact same thing. It really, where, where, where things become, where the rubber meets the road, is probably the best way to put it, is, is the actual implementation of those policies and procedures in a way that is meaningful and impactful for your business. Yeah, how do you do that? Um, so <laughs> a lot of, sorry, so a lot of what I talked about um, around alignment, stakeholders, principles, and then under, you know, treating your, your stakeholders as, um, as consumers, but also active contributors to compliance is the way you do it. Like you literally, I think the, the best analogy I can use is literally treat the work like you would a project, gather the requirements, understand what they're doing, and then work to overlay the policy 
so that you're, you're, you're basically mirroring or matching what their activities are to that policy. That's literally treat it like a project. And I, I mean, all kidding aside, bring them into the process. They'll hate it, but bring them in. And in, in the long run, they'll actually be very thankful. Because a lot of times what happens if you don't bring them in, you end up in, you end up in a typical environment where everybody hates the compliance and security people. Right, because they feel like they're laying down the law. Um, and and if you, you can avoid that by literally engaging very early and meaningfully and understanding what you know, your, business, your, your business functions are actually doing. I know it's a super non-technical answer, but it comes down to just a lot of its communication and then alignment and then you know, making sure that you're working off a standard set of principles. Good. Yeah. So um, it it doesn't really have a t <laughs> it doesn't have a take necessarily on evidence. Um, it certainly could be extended to. Um, I think you know. It, I think the way to do it would be to probably set up a direct, so, so what happens is when you initiate comply, you basically create a repo local, and the way you would solve it would be to create a directory for evidence gathering and then extend, like say, that HTML page to show progress, not only on the policy and procedure, but the evidence that, that backs that policy and procedure. So it doesn't have a strong stance on it today, but it certainly could be extended to. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great call out. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, you were mentioning something about integrating the communication pieces. So, for example, if you have like a document that's like, hey, you want to be strong passwords at our organization, um, and you want to also create tickets, like, would that document then link back to those tickets that were created? Like, hey, we have to add strong passwords to this service, that service. Yeah, you could. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And then it has some other functions too, like, um, it actually has cron integration, which I haven't quite figured out. So there's some automation for some things that have to happen on a regular cadence. Um, so like you know, looking at machine builds, for example, um, or looking at creating hardware lists uh, for your organization. It does have some reminders that you can set up in cron as well. I haven't dug deep into that, that element of it, but the ticketing absolutely um, looks like, again, using GitHub tickets, you can label um, the tickets in GitHub, and Comply will pick them up based on the label. Okay, it looks like we're back in action. So, kind of looping back in, um, kind of where we left off, I, I showed you the Markdown document that we had created um, as an example, and we put the headers in already in place, and we'll what we want to show is the program actually will take that 
document and add it into the web page that comes from Comply. So it's, it's actually extensible enough that we can add our own extra uh, policy in place. And that's kind of where I was going now. I'm going to pull down from uh, the, the Move.io repository. We're going to pull down all of the example policies that they have. And then we're going to add our small one to it and then probably get back into questions. But that's. Uh, that's what I'm going to start doing. I'll let Joel kind of walk everybody through it while I run the keyboard. Thanks, Jeff. Sure. So, th so what we have? So, there's a couple of different. Comply creates a couple of different directories. Um, one of the directories, uh, it's the, the one that Jeff's in, is for all the policies, right? So you'll see, um, you know, there's a bunch of MD files here. Again, um, Comply is primarily focused on SOC 2. Its policies, uh, its default policies actually aren't the best. Um, they're, they're, I don't know how, I, I would say they're subpar, a few years old. Um, but for the, the, the purposes of, um, what we're demonstrating will, um, will, what Jeff did was he actually modified some of the, the comply um, markdown so that it's um, more in line with um, what we want to do from an open source perspective. So he's, he's actually, uh, when he runs comply build, um, he's actually taking uh, comply and telling it to render the markdown into PDFs. And that's going to create a directory called output. Um, and within the output directory, there'll be that HTML page as, as well as um, all of the, the rendered um, policies as PDFs. Just, it just, out, it just created the HTML page, and you'll see it run through, hopefully. There it goes. And rendered all the, the markdown. So basically, it took all the markdown and created PDFs, and now we have a web page. So I'm going to go show you the website, and then we'll copy in a, our own custom document and create it again and see that it shows up. So I think from uh, Joel's slides, you'll recognize this one, um, except we changed the organization a little bit. It's now test org instead of. Uh, and you can see here, <laughs> this is a great example of <laughs> where comply is not being maintained, right? Yeah. Um, over under policies, it's given us a bunch of uh, examples. These are straight off of the comply, the strong DM comply site. They're all. Um, actually, not bad. Well, uh, if we went into the MD and put our, our right file names in, it has a lot of the basic information that you would need for each one of these. So the 80% the that Joel mentioned that you can get from a template are, are sitting here for the policies that they've already put together for SOC 2 and a basic program. Um, and then you can obviously modify these to match exactly what you're doing if you want to password policy that says I've only got 12 characters, we can put that in there. Um, if you want a password policy that says we've got 24 with MFA and uh, you know, both on an on a iPhone and, and on a hardware piece of equipment, you can go do that, that as well. You can take it as far as you want. So I want your password to be 12345. That's what's on my luggage. Just kidding. Um, so I'm going to kill that. And I'm going to go add our file now. Our
our file being this one, which I've saved in a different directory. I'm just going to copy it over because this is already saved. Um, so we'll see the same markdown in a generated format here shortly. He, this is a, a, I'm getting feedback. It's, <laughs> it's a new one. Well, for, for the purposes of the demo, we'll call it a new one. Okay. It's a new one. It's, it's actually a snippet of, oops, I'm not being recorded when I do that. It's a snippet of one of ours, our yep. InfoSec policy. I just took the little first piece out of it, um, turned it into a markdown, and called it a new file. I'm going to copy that into the directory that it generates on. I didn't think you wanted to see me create the markdown because that was really slow. Yeah. Of course. All right. It's, I don't like. <laughs> it's always tough when you're. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There we go. This one right here is the one that we added. Um, you notice we already had an information security policy, so now we have two of them. An InfoSec, that one's the one that I put in there. And when you click on it, you get the same style format of documents that maintains consistency. You notice that little header that was at the top of the markdown file that I put in there got turned into you know, table of contents, titles. Um, it's also on the title or the file name it changed, and then what controls that it goes against ends up in here. Um, without you having to fill out tables and such, you just put it right at the top. Cool. Thanks, Jeff. We'll swap back. All right, so just kind of start wrapping up here. Um, so what can you all do to help? Um, so very much a group effort. Um, if you're interested, please join the Slack channel. Um, it's a great place to start. Um, 
we do need help hacking on the, the comply fork. Um, so, you know, just to, if you if you read if you see the README under compliance um, under the move repo, um, you'll see that we'd like to extend this out to other compliance standards. The one um, that is the lowest hanging fruit for us is PCI. Um, there's an opportunity to take um, international compliance, bring it into play. Um, we want to. Um, also, um, you know, obviously update um, and create an easier install process for comply. Um, you can feel free to add templates, um, even if they're not necessarily tied to a compliance standard. Um, anything that you would be willing to contribute, please do. Uh, we certainly need content. Um, and then, you know, the GitHub discussions, um, I'll start that. I'll see the discussion in, in uh, GitHub. Feel free to actively contribute your thoughts. Um, and finally, the conclusion. Um, so, you know, compliance is difficult, right? It's, it's not gonna be easy. But again, um, you know, if, if it's a group effort, um, everybody can win. Um, we end up with, um, better balance in our policies, right? We end up with um, less security theater and more meaningful activity around security and compliance. Um, we, do, we reduce barriers, right? So this information, like I mean, I went out and looked for like an intro to SOC and the first thing I get smacked with is like, you know, a paywall and somebody asking for money to, to have access to um, just an intro to SOC. And so, you know, I think by, by tackling um, compliance from a, a collaborative and open source perspective, we can knock down those barriers. Um, and then finally, cost, right? So a lot of this is hidden away. Um, like I mentioned, you have to pay for it. Um, and a lot of this information uh, could be easily disseminated um, through, through a group effort. So, you know, again, I think the, the takeaway here is, um, Compliance as a group effort um, creates a higher standard and um, creates velocity, reduces cost, um, and we don't have to go it alone anymore. And then I know we had we had a little brief uh, interruption for Q and A. Um, feel free if, if you have anybody has any further questions, I'm I'm more than glad to answer them. Hey Nick. Yep. So, so some of it, um, some of it is regulatory. So if you're dealing with sponsor banks, um, you're typically going to be exposed to their AML BSA um, requirements that are regulatory because you know, and, and they will pass those down to you as doing business with a sponsor bank. Um, others are industry specific. So PCI is a great example of uh, industry specific compliance standard. And that compliance standard, for all intents and purposes, the card brands in those use cases are the judge, jury, and executioner. So if they deem you non-compliant, they can literally prevent you from accepting or dispersing money. Um, so sometimes, Regulatory efforts, surprisingly, are easier to swallow than what I would call indus uh, industry um, regulations. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, I think that like I think the discussions are a great place to provide that you know where people can ask about guidance and then receive answers to their questions. To me, that's probably the best place to have that happen. It's it's hard to um, 
part of, part of the, the audit effort um, is subject to the auditor's interpretation, at least historically that's what I've experienced. So it's, the guidance is directional at best, um, but I do think it's, the, the community around compliance should be able to share their experiences and certainly answer questions around um, audit efforts and, and how to best navigate those waters. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I mean, it's all kind of nebulous. It is, it is, yeah. It, it's, it is, it's kind of nebulous. It's, it's really hard to nail down, like every audit I, well, I found that if I have the same auditor year after year, my audits become consistent. When I switch auditors or I'm, I'm forced to switch auditors, I don't go back to square one, but the auditing effort is, is slightly different, right? I mean, the first time you go through an audit in a new organization, it's usually the, the most difficult, that first go round. After that, um, it does become much more stable, but once you do switch auditors, you, you feel a little bit of, of thrashing again. Not nearly to the extent of when you first go through an audit, but. Um, uh, would you say it's more important to focus on, like, giving them documentation, getting the policies and procedures than focusing on user auditors? Or would you weight them as kind of independent focus points? I tend to focus on policy, procedure, controls. Um, and then when I've made, a, I don't have a hard, fast line in the sand, but when, it's probably more intuitive, I guess. When I feel like I'm, I'm coming to a place where um, my policies and procedures controls are, are somewhat stable, then I will start actively engaging um, vendors to, to perform an audit. Um, and, and sometimes too, just through experience, um, you kind of get a feel if, if you've dealt with different auditing firms, um, you know, what their styles are, what their approach is. Um, and they all, you know, they, they all tend to be fairly nuanced. And I mean, there's times where I've, I've gone after um, vendors because I wanted a specific auditor that I used in the past because I really like that auditor's approach. Sure. So I know I was gonna make a funny, like I'm wearing this shirt, right, that says I love audits. I was gonna make like this horrible statement about how audits all suck. Um, but I was kind of thinking about it this morning and I was like, actually, you know, my, my dislike of audits, like actually, you know, and, and having to, to perform uh, this workshop actually kind of gave me some new perspective and, and forced me to like confront kind of some of the problems I've certainly felt around audits and, you know, and having conversations with others what they've felt around uh, audits and compliance. So it's kind of funny. I think ironically, I kind of do love them, you know, just in a begrudgingly way. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all. I appreciate your time. You, it looks like you get a little bit of time back. Um, feel free to, you know, the, the community will be out there. Um, feel free to contribute, ask questions. I'll be in there as much as I possibly can be to, you know, again, I'm a fairly strong passion about seeing this thing um, get some momentum and succeed. So thank you. And thank you, Jeff, for manning the keyboard.